Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Hope you're doing well. Uh, we got another easy problem for us today for our Strengths Materials course. We're going to be looking at torque transfer by gears, uh, otherwise known as gear ratios in class. And we've already covered the basics of this in our previous video, which was on power transmission. Uh, if you want to watch that, you can click the link at the top. But pretty much the basics of that video was we had a pulley system where pulley A was generating a power and transferring it into pulley B. As pulley A completed a full cycle, the other pulley would not. This meant that pulley A had a greater angular velocity with a smaller radius compared to pulley B because it was completing a full cycle in a same amount of time frame it took for pulley B to not complete a full cycle. Now we're going to use the same concept to explain uh, some additional relationships inside of our gear ratio problems. Now we're going to imagine that we have a system of gears, uh, two gears to be exact, exact, and we can imagine that gear A is connected to a shaft which is powered by a motor. And as that power is being transmitted, it is 100% transferred into the second gear, gear B. Now looking at the assembly from the front, we've labeled some things here so that we can break down these final relationships, which will help us solve these problems here. Now, as I mentioned, this power A is starting in the first gear and is actually developing a torque. We remember that torque is simply force times distance. And given that these gears are interlocked, we're going to have a force reaction that's equal and opposite in the opposing gear. However, for torque, it's going to be slightly different because the torque in A is not going to be equal to torque in B because that principle of force times distance still applies. And we have a larger radius in A than we have in B. With all that being said, we're left with these final uh, formulas here, or the final understanding from all the words that were just being said. It's force at A will equal the force at B. So we're just going to replace it with the uniform F because of our rules for equilibrium, where a force is applied. The equal and opposite will be reacting. The torques will be different in A and B because you have a different radius, which is your distance in the force times distance formula. Solving for torque at A and torque at B, you'll notice that the only difference in variable is going to be the radius A for torque at A and the radius B for torque at B, which derives our final relationships, which are the main important part for these problems. The torque at A over the torque at B, or the ratio of torque A to torque B, is going to be equal to the ratio of the radius at A over the radius at B. The next ratio that we need to derive or understand is that related to the arc length of these gears. So as you go from an initial position to a final position uh, with respect to the gear, in the opposing gear, you're going to actually cover that same amount of distance because of those teeth interlocking. You cannot have one gear move a further initial to final than the other. So that's the main bit of understanding there. And we remember that the arc length formula is going to be equal to radius times theta, or that angle between the initial and final position. Now, using this understanding, we can clearly see that the S will be the same. But if you have a smaller gear, you're going to have a larger angle created between that distance. And understanding all of that, you're finally left with these formulas, which is similar to the top up here. We relate that the arc length at A will equal the arc length at B. Solving for theta, you have the arc length over the radius at A. And the theta B, very similar, dictated by the radius at B. Solving for the relationship, you have the ratio of theta A over theta B. It's going to be equal to the radius B over the radius of A, which is the inverse of what we had previously, which is important to understand. Now, this relationship also applies for angular velocity as well, because we remember that angular velocity is simply putting a rate on that change in angle. So we can use the same relationship for angular velocity here as well. Now, let's hop into the problem and see what we're dealing with. All right, so let's hop into the problem right here. We got our relationships at the top. We got a sketch to help us solve this problem. And the problem is as follows. We have a motor providing 180 kilowatts of power at 400 RPM. It's this big thing right here and it's providing it to the drive shaft shown. The maximum shearing stress in the three solid steel shafts must not exceed 70 MPA. It's giving us the shearing modulus of 80 GPA, and it says gears A, B, and C supply 40 kilowatts, 60 kilowatts, and 80 kilowatts respectively to operating units in the plant. 
you'll notice that these each add up to the total power generated by the original motor. That's important to keep in mind for this problem. And it wants us to determine the minimum satisfactory diameter for shafts D, E, and F. Now, once again, a good way to start with uh, problems like this is getting RPM in terms of an angular velocity unit, which would be in radians per second. So if we know that this motor is generating that RPM on shaft E, we can then say that the angular velocity at E will equal to 400 revolutions per minute to conversion of one minute per 60 seconds and two pi radians for every cycle or revolution completed. That's going to leave you with 41.89 radians per second. Now, the next thing we need to do is once again think back to what we have in this problem and what we can use together to solve for new unknowns. And we can recall that the power formula is equal to torque times angular velocity. And we just solved for angular velocity in shaft E. We know that the power generated by the motor connected to shaft E is 180 kilowatts. So rearranging this formula, we can get the torque. So torque at E will be simply the power at E over the angular velocity and we have 180 kilowatts, so we need to do 10 to the 3, and that'll be a newton meter per second over what we just solved for, which is 41.89 radians per second. Radians of the unit list convention, we are finally left with a value of 4,297.2 newtons per meter. And we know that the whole point of this problem is to solve for diameters. So we're going to have to bring this back to our OG formula in order to back solve for the diameter in the polar moment of inertia equation. So that being rearranged, we have something that looks like this. I'll start with the units just so that we can see uh, what's getting plugged in. So we have the allowable shear stress as 70 newtons per millimeter squared. So we're rearranging this formula for shearing stress on the solo side. And then we have what we already solved for, 4297.2 meter. Then we have C, which is the diameter over two. So diameter E over two, and the polar moment of inertia on the bottom, pi over two, DE over two, and power four. And solving that, you will be left with 67.9. That's your first answer. Now, to get to the second answer, we have to start using these relationships here. So what did we just solve for? We just solved for an angular velocity at E. And if we wanted to go to D or F, we could pick either one, but let's just say the angular velocity at E over the angular velocity at D must be equal to the radius at D over the radius at E just based on our rules or our relationships that we solved for previously. Now isolating for WD or the angular velocity at D, we will have angular velocity at E, and we can also use the relationship of diameter. We can use the relationship of circumference as well, because we know that circumference is simply two pi r, two pi is a constant. So we can use any of those uh, in this case as a relationship. In this problem, we're typically given it in terms of teeth. So you'll see in a bit why that's important. But for now, we will have the relationship as follows. Now, instead of R, let's consider the number of teeth we have. So we have 48 for E and 24 for D, meaning that the angular velocity at D will be equal to what we previously solved for, 41.89. That's in radians per second. And the R at E is going to be uh, having the same type of relationship as the number of teeth once again. So we're going to have 48 in place of the R here, and then 24 in place of the R here for D. Solving that, you are left with simply double the angular velocity that you had in shaft E. 
which is 83.78 radians per second. We're doing the same type of thing that we did before. We got to solve once again for the torque at D, which means it's the power over the angular velocity. We know that D, based on our problem here, is generating a power of 40 kilowatts in gear A. So we know that the power in the shaft is going to be equivalent to 40 kilowatts. So 40 times 10 to the 3 over the angular velocity that we solved for. That will be equal to 477.4 newtons per meter. Once again, you're doing the same similar type of solving that we did over here, except now we're doing it for shaft D. Simply plugging in the numbers that we solved for, we have 70. And then the previous torque for TD was 477.4. We got DD for 2. Polar moment of inertia. DD of 2 to the power of 4. Solving that once again. Very uh, tedious kind of solving problem for you guys, but it's going to help with your understanding of those relationships, and I hope the theory helped too. I'm just going to skip ahead to the final answer, but it's using the same type of logic uh, for shaft F because the number of teeth in shaft F is the same as D, so we're using that 2 to 1 relationship uh, in this uh, relationship up here. So we're going to have WF is going to be equal to WD, which is 83.78 once again, and we're plugging that in to solve for torque in shaft F and the diameter and I'll skip to that. And that'll leave you with a final answer for DF equal to 41.1 millimeters. And all in all you have three final answers here for the minimum allowable diameters for each shaft based on the power transmitted and the allowable shear stress for each one. So I hope uh, this video helped with the concepts and you'll see at the top why there are so many torque videos because there's just so many concepts that get covered in such a little amount of time. So uh, yeah, I hope this catalog is kind of building on your understanding and really building a good foundation for that. Um, so thanks for watching.